Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Zoom at 8. My name is Julianne Peterson, and I am your host every Tuesday night for Zoom at 8. Uh, you know, we've been doing this for four over four years. We've closed about 200 million just from this community. So it is worthwhile to put it on your calendar every Tuesday night. Um, on my day job, I am a senior director at Old Capital Lending. And Old Capital has been around since, well, for 38 years. So we've been closing deals most of the time in multifamily, but we'll look at other asset classes, multi-use. You know, we'll do mobile home parks. What do you got? You got office that's having a really hard time. Uh, any of the other asset classes that are out there, we'll take a look at. Industrial is doing well as well. So that's something that you're looking into, kind of thinking, I don't know if I want to stay in multifamily. We can help you with that. Um, if you're looking at a deal, and obviously I would love to be your, I'm going to want to earn your business as your uh, lender of choice. All I'm going to need is your T12 rent roll the offering memorandum, that's the beautiful pictures that has a lot of silliness going on inside. Sometimes they don't tell the truth on those OMs. Um, and then your underwriting so that we can see how you're going to manage and run, operate this deal. So would love to have that opportunity. Um, we've got a lot of people in the room that have been here for all four years and I want you to get to know them. The reason I created Zoom at 8 was because some of the education programs don't have an ecosystem where you can basically make a phone call, set up a webinar, and have people come to it. That's kind of what happens here at Zoom at 8, building relationships, finding vendors. And so knowing who you can do business with, and they're all here, they're all vetted for you. Um, so come every Tuesday night, we're here. Um, tonight, I'm very excited about our upcoming com live conversation with our industry expert, Keely Hubbard. She's here tonight, and she's got a lot of great tips and tricks and support for you as a capital raiser, as well as maybe you're looking for some sales training. So Keely Hubbard is here. I'm very excited for you to get to know her. Um, you know, the the industry has changed. And I think what you want to do right now is, as Sandia said, operations, if you're a syndicator, and if you're not a syndicator, and you're looking to capital raise, you need to work on yourself, you need to figure out how do I do this? How do I do sales? Not everybody can go and talk to people. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that is the skill. It is a skill. It can be learned, but you need to have the right people on your team. And so tonight, I am very excited to introduce you to my, well, I think you're, I'm going to call you my friend, Keely. Um, yeah, I, 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 I think you'll let me do that. Um, Keely Hubbard is, uh, she's located out of uh, Texas. She is a high ticket sales coach and capital raising expert. So she was a former VP of sales for an international organization where she implemented her custom sales strategies to grow annual revenues from 40 million to 220 million in less than four years. So we're talking to a rock star tonight. As a sales coach and business strategist, Keely helps her clients confidently close deals and raise more capital through intentional, strategic and authentic conversations that win. They win with raving fans. You guys ever heard of raving fans? We're going to get to know what that means tonight. Keely also invests in multifamily, in large multifamily, by the way, and also in vineyards in Texas. So I'm, I'm excited to hear about that. We should all have brought our rosés or whatever we're drinking. Um, she is a managing partner of Hubbard capital group where she she's relentless in exceeding her investors expectations so tonight i am excited to help you all learn how to win capital in in conversations in your actions in your behaviors and keely's going to help us with that so 
Welcome to tonight's Zoom at eight. Keely, how are you? So good. Thank you. It's so awesome to see everybody. And I've been looking forward to this, Julie. I feel like we scheduled it months ago. And I, I was know, like, man, this summer's already flown by. But here we I are. Yeah. And it's going to be fun. So thank it's you. It's going to be me. great. Yes. So if we could do one thing, everybody, let's give all of our attention to Keely tonight. Go up to the right hand side of your screen and put on speaker view. Now you're going to see me and I love that. I see Keely because she she's on my screen, but soon you'll see uh, the conversation going forward. So Keely, um, I have been on your track. I have some very good friends of mine who have worked with you, who just speak so highly of you. And when it's like peanut butter, you just want to spread you around. So I, I want you to talk tonight and cover a couple things. I mean, I've got notes. I've got so many things I want to talk to you tonight and have this conversation be successful. Um, what I'm most interested in knowing is, you know, we're in a time where there's no deals. There's more buyers than there are sellers. And how does somebody who has never sold has is new to multifamily and wants to get into this, you know, kind of came into this pretty in the last, I don't know, six, eight months where I'm going to get rich quick. And somebody told me I can be a co GP or a capital raiser. Right. But it's more than that. It's the conversation. It's the relationships. Can you help us with that tonight. Yes, I, I would love that. You know, I have to give you all a fair warning. I'm the person that tells you the stuff you probably don't want to hear. <laughs> But I want you to, to have a realistic perspective of it when you're getting into this space, because I've seen too many people that you know, there's a lot of fantasy marketing out there and it works, right? It, it draws us in. It speaks to our ego. Our ego wants the easy path. We want the easy button. And I'm the one that says this is probably going to take you longer than you think it's going to take. And it's probably going to be harder than you realize it will be. But it's worth it in the end. And it's very rewarding. And I want you to know that because I see too many people that you know, we compare ourselves We're like, man, this guy just raised $10 million overnight, or this guy has launched, you know, this program and he's going to teach me how to raise 70 million. And you don't know the stories behind it and how they got to that place. And 40 million of it was private equity money. Like there's a lot of things that, that go into this. And so I want y'all to go in eyes wide open. So you don't get discouraged and judge yourself and start comparing yourself and internalizing it. Like what's wrong with me and why am I not on the same trajectory? So it takes time, but you can build an investor community of raving fans where it doesn't matter what investment you bring to them. They, they know you, they love you. They're like, they got your back. They're like I'm totally in and they don't really know what the returns are yet. So, and that comes from time and really cultivating relationships. And like Julie said, now's a wonderful time to be raising capital. Even though you don't have a deal, now's the time to be talking to investors. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we we all want to believe that we can do this, right? I mean, we want we all think we can, but there is a method to the madness. And so in that, there is a conversation. So I want to talk about the conversations. I want to talk about the behaviors, and I want to talk about the actions, right? And those are the ones things that I want to make sure that everybody is taking notes. This stuff is really, really important. I mean, the content that Keely puts out, every time I get an email, blog, or something that she has posted comes into my email, I, I look forward to opening it and spending time. This is how amazing Keely's content is, and it works. It truly works. I know you posted one time, about getting on a phone call, a phone call where, okay, we have 30 seconds or 30 minutes to visit. And you made it so that you were providing a service to them and checking in. I just love the way you phrase that. You, you always have a, a way of approaching these conversations. And I, that's what I really want. You are a specialist in this. So conversations, let's kind of have you un- uh, uh, take that apart, right? Unpack it, unpack the conversations. What do those look like? How do we start? Love that question. And, you know, I think, let me start one step back because I want you to understand the importance of investor conversations. 
there's, a, you know, there's probably two schools of thought. There's the school of thought that it's funnels, it's websites, it's automations, and all that stuff is important, right? 52 blog posts and content like crazy and pump out stuff from chat GPT and all of that stuff will help you in your business. But this is like the opposite of the field of dreams. Y'all remember that movie? If you build it, they will come. In this business, it's like you can have the most beautiful stadium, right? Your ecosystem that you've built and nobody knows that it exists because we're not out there generating new conversations and talking to investors. So I just want you to know up front that all that stuff is great, but developing real sales skills where you feel comfortable sharing your message and reaching out to investors and actually picking up the phone is going to raise more money than any automation website or funnel ever will. And if you want to get to a place one day where you send one email and you raise 5 million in 24 hours, that is absolutely possible. But to get to that point, it starts with talking to people. You've got to build that organic list from the inside out. I'm not the type that believes that you need thousands of investors on your list. I have clients that are raising 15 million a year that have 360, 375 people on their list, but they know them so well. They talk to them. They see them face-to-face -face in webinars once a month. They're not just out there trying to buy accredited investor list. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with all that, but what I want y'all to see is it always comes back to people knowing you. Just because we have thousands of people in our database doesn't mean they're going to invest with us, even if the deal is a killer deal. And I know there's a lot of you in here that are veterans that have been doing this for a long time. And you probably realize that too. We got to know people. So if we're going to meet somebody for the first time, the most important thing that you do at the beginning of any phone call is disarm them and get their walls down. And that's the very first step of my sales process is called disarm. And the reason for that is people are so terrified that they're going to get on a zoom call with you and even though you said hey let you know let's get on a zoom call i would love to learn more about you and your investment history in the back of their mind they're terrified that you're going to get on there and you're going to pitch them and you're going to push them into investing with you now why is that it's not because you you just the first time you've met them it's not like you did that to them where's that fear coming from type it in the chat where why are they so afraid like where's that coming from why is that their biggest fear let me know in the chat. Skeptics, yep. What, are, what is their experience as a consumer? Yep, that's what the market has done, you nailed it. That's yeah. their experience with all the other salespeople out there that say book a call, book a discovery call. And there's all these triggering phrases that people, if they do eventually agree to it, even when there's language like that, they're still terrified that you're gonna get on there and pitch them. And the other thing that salespeople do, bad behaving salespeople, right? They get people to put their walls up, which is the whole reason we have this step of disarming them, is they pump them for information, right? They ask them a ton of questions, and then they flip that information around and use it against them to try to force them into buying, investing with you. Y'all have experienced this, right? Like everybody's had at least one horrible experience with a salesperson where you're just like, oh, I can't stand salespeople, right? I've been in sales for a long time. I can't stand salespeople, okay? So I'm like on a mission to repair this horrible reputation that salespeople have. So we gotta get people's walls down because they expect the worst because that's what they've experienced, even though it has nothing to do with you. And so my favorite way to do that is to tell them up front, like if I were having a conversation uh, with Julie and Julie's a new investor, I'd say, Julie, I've been looking forward to connecting with you and learning more about your investment you know, history, what you've done. I probably have a ton of questions just to better understand your world. Are you okay if I ask you a lot of questions? Just, they always say yes, right? They like that because they want to they want to know that you want to know those questions. And I say we might have a great conversation, but at some point in this, maybe you decide that for whatever reason, this just isn't the right fit. You're not interested in investing in vineyards, right? I'm choosing a whatever asset class. You're not interested in investing in vineyards. It just doesn't feel right for your goals. If you get to that point, are you going to be okay telling me that? Mm -hmm. Now I'm getting her to say no up front, right? Like. If, if they're so terrified, you're gonna push them into saying yes, get them to say no up front. And I say, are you sure you, you seem like a nice woman? And she's like, yeah, I'll tell you if it's not the right fit. I'm like, okay, I appreciate that. The flip side of that is maybe after I understand you and your family's goals and what you've invested in and what you're looking for, maybe I decide from my perspective and what we look for within our investor community, that's just, it's not the right fit for me and I'm not the right person to help you. Are you gonna be all right if I let you know that? 
I was like, well, yeah, I mean, I, I hope you would. I've been using this for since 2011. I've been using this and coaching it and teaching it. And every time they're like, yeah, I, you know, I hope you, I hope you tell me that. I said, okay. And you know, the third option is we have a great conversation and you're like, Hey, this stuff looks great. I'm interested in it. You know, maybe investing in the future. And if we get to that point, we'll figure out what those next steps look like. Are you cool with that? Are you comfortable with that? Whatever question you want to use at the end. And all of a sudden, all you've done is like get rid of all the sales pressure and all the tension from the very beginning of the phone call, because it doesn't matter how amazing your questions are that you want to ask them and how good you are at your pitch. If their walls are up, there's like you're wasting your time. If their walls are up, we can't have an open and honest conversation about what's not working in the most sensitive subject that people don't like talking about. You want people to admit that you know everything's not so great in their financial life and their investments we got to get their walls down first and so that is the first and most important step of any investor call but julie i'm gonna pause here because you know i'll just keep rolling and you'll have no to get i cake. just love it yeah. and i i think just based on my experience and i know there's a lot of people in the room that have had the same experience where it's awkward right you're like hey what do i what do you do? I know we, you talked about this on a podcast that I looked, I was watching. Um, like, how do you get that conversation to say, oh, let's talk about this. Let's get to know what I do. Cause I'm hearing all about what you do and how do you kind of message that, Hey, let's get on a phone call. Right. I think that's so awkward. So it I'd is. love to hear your, your For thoughts candy. on that. <laughs> You know, I always think of it at like networking events. So, you know, you go to a networking event and just, I'll give you a couple networking tips. Now I'm talking outside of real estate. We all, we all love each other, right? Like it's like a huge family reunion, all these conferences we go to, like, like, man, these are my people, right? There's angel, we see angel, it's like huge hugs. Like, man, I love these people. But you know, there's not a lot of passive investors at these conferences because it's, it's for peers, it's our colleagues, right? It's all of us together. So. If you're going to network and try to generate those new conversations find places where you can be the only real estate expert in the room those those are your niches and being able to speak on that and so when i go to networking events i gotta be honest with y'all i hate networking you're like what yeah i've been in sales for a long time and i don't like it like it's awkward for me i'm not the girl that's going to work the room of 100 people i'm kind of the one that's like i'm just gonna sit in the corner drink my scotch. Don't feel bad for me. Don't be like, oh, look at that poor girl in the corner. Like, this is my happy place. I'm fine. Right. But if we're in business, we want to have a business. We got to talk about our business, which means we have to network. So if I'm going to force myself to get out there and take my very valuable time, which all of you in here, I'm sure your time is worth at least a thousand dollars an hour. If you go look at, you know, how much money you're making, how much money you could make, if you were to dedicate your time, it is a lot of, it is expensive to network. So do it effectively. So if you're going to go to a networking event, for me personally, I look for three people. That's my goal. And if I find these three people, and I'll tell you what I'm trying to do, what my target is with these three people. But if I find those three people in 30 minutes, I'm done, I'm leaving. There's no point in, I'm not just gonna hang around because the event goes till 9 p.m. I'm, I'm out of there, right? Cause I got other things to do. And I gotta, if I hate doing it, how many of you in here don't, please tell me I'm not alone. Put it in the chat. Do you, how many of you in here don't like networking? Okay, I see you, Daniela. Yes, right? We're like, oh man, it's cringy, okay. And it's on your calendar. You're like, oh, I'm supposed to go to this networking event. So if you don't like it, Dennis, <laughs> I knew, I knew Angel, I knew that was you. And Dennis, I can just tell by the way you're smiling at me, man, you're like a people person. Um, Sandia, yes, I know y'all are incredible. So for those of us that are not gifted in networking and don't like it, we got to find ways to be successful at it in short periods of time. So you go in, you get your three people, you leave and you're like, success, I can do this again next week. That was a huge success. So where it's not draining. So when I find these three people, my goal is to have a meaningful conversation with them. And that conversation might only be seven minutes, 10 minutes. I mean, I'm not trying to pitch my whole business. All I'm trying to do is find out everything I can about this person. What brought them to the event? What do they do? Who are they trying to meet? Who's their like perfect client? I let them talk all about their, what are they excited about in their business? What got them into that industry? What's their vision for the future? And I just let them talk about their favorite subject, which is them. And they will ask you in return, wait, what do you do? And that's your moment to shine. And now you have all this information about who they are as a person and you can really cater the explanation of your business and how you help people based on the person that you're talking to. And so the way that I transition it, I know, Julie, I'm like going way big no, circle. I love this because this it. is one of the conversations that I read that you had posted and I shared it with my husband. So keep going because this is great. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, good. 
Um, so you're talking to somebody, have a great conversation, right? You're talking a little bit about investing. Hopefully you've done a good enough kind of mini pitch that you've piqued their interest and they want to know more. Because you talk a little bit about at high level. And what I typically do to transition is I want to say something like, um, you know, Julia, this is, I've loved talking to you. I don't want to, I don't want to hold you hostage here. I know you probably have a lot of other people you want to meet, but I've, I've really enjoyed this. Do you want to grab coffee next week? I would love to talk about this more, continue the conversation. And I'm telling y'all, you can build a business on coffees and lunches. You can build multi-million dollar capital raises on coffees and lunches. Sandia is proof of that. I don't know where you went, Sandia. I can't see your face anymore. I hope you're still in here, she is. but she's, she's brilliant at it. And that is, and you're going to meet people that may not be an investor, but maybe they're a referral partner. Maybe they will put you, maybe I have met people that are the head of a networking group full of my people. And they're like, man, can you come talk sales? Can you come talk about investing in vines or investing in vineyards? And that relationship came just from networking them, me asking them, who can I connect you to? Like, who's your perfect client? Who do you want to meet? Who do you love working with? And becoming a collector of people. So now I have a pool to go dig into and start doing introductions. And when you become that connector, much like Julie is, mm -hmm. right? Julie, that's who you are is connecting people. You are so valuable. And so it just keep it casual, but say, I'd love to continue our conversation. Do you want to grab coffee next week? I, I want to make sure we have more time to chat and, you know, we could grab coffee, lunch. I'm going to be in your area on Thursday or I could do Wednesday and just pull out your phone and start looking at your calendar and set it up while you're standing right there. I'm just looking for three of those. And if it takes an hour, fine. If it takes 30 minutes, great. But once I've got my three, then I'm out of there and I'm just filling up my calendar with coffees and lunches and meeting people, finding now, out how I add value to their network. Now there is one, uh, give us the solution for somebody that maybe is not the right fit for you. I just love how you do this. So, okay. Well, how many of y'all, and let me know, let me know in the chat, how many of y'all, and I may be missing some questions in here. So Julie, we'll, we'll get to them. We'll get to you. Okay. Okay. Um, how many of you have ever been to a networking event and you know, like, and these people are really nice, but they suck you into a conversation and you're just like, I gotta go. Right. Like I gotta go. I've been talking to this person for 30 minutes and I don't know how to gracefully exit the conversation and your eyes are really big and you're looking at your partner behind you, like rescue me, but they're not catching your signal. Have y'all ever been in that situation before? Oh, yeah. Okay. Bathroom. Right. We love these people. You what, Sandia? You go to the bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> I go to the bathroom. And I have used that before, but what I typically will do is I fall on my sword instead. I just say, hey, Oh my God, I've been talking your ear off. I know there's other people here. You probably need to meet. It was so great connecting with you. I'm sure I'm going to see you at another event in the future. And I just reach my hand out, to shake their hand. It's like, I'm doing them a favor because they got to go meet other people. So it's a nice way to help them save face. I do the same thing at restaurants. You know, you order, you ask the waitress for an iced tea and she forgets. And she comes back by multiple times and she forgot. Maybe you asked her again. She still didn't bring it. And you're like, you don't want to be that person that's like, hey, lady, like, where's my ST? Because she might spit in it, right? So instead, you're like, I've had a really long day. Like, I can't remember. Did I ask you for an iced tea? Oh, and she's like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. And then she goes and gets it. It's the same strategy. It's just fall on your sword, right? We don't need to be per look perfect. But if we need to exit a conversation at a networking event, just say, I don't want to hold you hostage. I, we've been chatting for a long time and I've loved the conversation. But I know you got to get, I know you got to move on and talk to other people. So it was so great connecting. Hopefully I'll see you at another one of these. Reach your hand out, shake their hand, smile. Go find your people, right? Go find your other two or your three people that you want to network with. I mean, just like such a great piece of, just a tidbit. And uh, I put it in my phone. So when I went to a conference, I was like, okay, I'm going to use this. And it truly really works great. You know, I love Sandia's strategy too. Where's the bathroom? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody yeah. will argue with you. <laughs> so one of the things that I can't stand, and it goes back to your question about, you know, salespeople, is that people, salespeople have a tendency to just show up and throw up. I think you called it something else. Uh, product vomit. Yeah, product vomit. Um, I think that nobody has taught them how to ask questions. And that mm -hmm. is the key to finding out solutions because that's what you're there to do. And so in capital raising, what are the questions that you want to be asking in order to open the doors up. You, you said, we're gonna visit. Is it okay if I ask you some questions? Are you okay to say no? What are some of those questions and how can we address those immediately? So why don't you take us through those? Yes. So remember, 
remember that if y'all can remember this cardinal sales rule, this apply, it doesn't matter what industry you're in. You could be selling private jets. You could be selling, you know, mattresses. It doesn't matter. Real estate investments. The rule is no pain, no sale, no pain, no sale. So we can't look at everybody like everybody's my investor. And I just got to be really friendly and know my investment really well and talk to enough people. And that's how I raise capital. And that's the problem is that, you know, there's these myths that are ingrained in us about how to be successful in sales. And people give up far too soon because they're like, this sucks. Like, this is awful. Like, I talk to all these people and I find the diamond in the rough. So I would tell you all that I would rather spend my time and talk to people that have problems that I fix. You've heard the saying, people brag, right? Sales trainers, I could sell ice to an Eskimo. It's like, cool. I would rather sell casts to people that have broken arms. I'd rather find all the people with broken arms if I'm selling casts. So before we ever get to pitching our deal, pitching our business, talking about how we can help them, you are committing sales malpractice if you don't first figure out what their problem is. How many of y'all in here have back pain? You're like, these are weird questions, Keely. Just play along with me. Anybody have back pain? Okay, Neil, I saw your hand. Okay, good. Angel, I know, right? We shouldn't be celebrating this. Woo, back pain. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I've had surgery for my back, right? Back pain's horrible. But let's pretend that you have back pain. If you don't, just pretend for me. You go to the doctor and you you meet this surgeon and you're like, I've had back pain for you know a couple years now. And you explain to him why you visited. And he's like, you know what? I think I can help you. And you're in his office, right? And he pulls down the screen and turns on the PowerPoint. And all of a sudden there's a slide deck popping up and he's clicking through slides and he's showing you all the testimonials of all the happy patients and all the backs that he's fixed. And then he proceeds to show you all of his accolades in his medical profession and all the journals that he's been written up in. And he goes into detail about how the surgery is gonna work and how he's gonna fix your back. And he didn't ask you not one question about your back pain. What are you going to do? Like, do you trust that doctor? We would hightail it. We'd, we'd do the Sandia. Where's the bathroom? <laughs> and we'd leave, right? We'd be out of there. So we have to look at it the same way with investing. We are committing capital raising malpractice. We'll call it that instead of sales malpractice by pitching people on our deals when we don't fully understand their problem. If you go to the doctor and you say, my back hurts, they say, where? Show me. How long? Is it dull pain? Or is it sharp pain on a scale of one to 10? How bad does it hurt? Lean to the right. What does that do? Lean to the right, lean to the left. How's it affecting your day-to-day -day life? Was there something that happened that made your back hurt? They ask you so many questions and we don't get upset with the doctor for asking us questions. So it is our responsibility when raising capital to ask questions of our investor to help them fully understand their problem. And for us to really figure out, do they have the problems that we fix? Number one. Number two, does it hurt bad enough that they want to fix it? You trying to raise capital from somebody that's made a million dollars in crypto and every, every day their account goes up 10 grand. That's not your person. <laughs> that's not your person until they have some pain that makes them you know, willing to do something different and make a change. So we've got to figure out, do they have the problems that I fix and how bad does it hurt? Do they want to fix it? So here, here's the issue though. What I see with <laughs> my sales teams did this. So and I love them, right? I love salespeople. Like I say, I hate salespeople, but the ones that I got to coach when I was in corporate, I had 600 salespeople and, and a bunch of directors, right? And sales managers and all the things. But, you know, it's like, these, these are my people. These are my, my sheep, right? We, I'm, the, I'm the shepherd. I got to teach them how to do this. And so the, <laughs> they would take that concept and they would tell their prospects what their pain points were. Instead of asking them, it's like, here's what your problem is, right? This mm. is why this isn't working. This is what's going to happen to you if you don't do something different now. You're not going to make it to retirement, blah, blah, blah. Because we're in the financial education business. And so we're having money, you know, questions or conversations around money, but they would tell people what their problem was instead of asking them the mm -hmm. questions because the words have to come out of your investor's mouth. If the words don't come out of your investor's mouth, they don't own it. They don't own it. It's your problem. It's not theirs. So we've got to ask those questions to get them to verbalize it. And to do the right thing by them where they feel like we, we actually care and they look at us like a trusted advisor, not a financial advisor, but a trusted advisor because we're asking really thoughtful questions. Now, the challenge is you can't just ask somebody off the bat like, uh, you know, Mike, I've been looking forward to chatting with you. I'm curious, what made you reach out to me? Mike's not going to say something like, well, you know, um, and I'm, do we have a mic in here? 
Yes, we do. Okay. I'm just using a hypothetical mic, right? Hey, Mike, mm -hmm. just hypothetical. Usually I say, John, John's like my prospect go-to. Um, but maybe we say like, Mike, you know, what made you reach out? And Mike's like, oh, well, you know, I've been interested in real estate for some time and thought, you know, apartment investing was pretty cool. It's like, oh, okay. Well, what got you interested in it? Oh, I saw the cash on cash returns, blah, blah, blah. We're not talking about the issue. We're not talking about what's wrong. And the, the problem with that is when you talk about the cash on cash returns and the tax benefits, all that stuff is important. I'm not saying pull that out of your conversation, but that does not motivate people to make a change and to do something different. That's probably a little bit scary if they've never invested before. What motivates them to make a change is pain they're experiencing right now or fear of that happening in the future. And so there's no urgency attached to the greed conversation. Look at how much money you could make. Look at how much, how many, you know, how much less taxes you could pay. Look at the cash on cash returns. We're not talking about the issue and there's no urgency associated with the pleasure pitch. So we've got to figure out what's not working in their existing investing strategy and why what's not working what are they invested in why is that how long have they been invested in stocks have they tried to do something different can you give me a recent example what happened all like just like the doctor all these questions to uncover what the issue is so what i want y'all to remember is that if we just ask that question out of the gate people hold their cards close to their vest because they're like I don't know this Keely girl. I'm not going to tell her all my problems, right? Especially something about finances that people are very, you know, it's a sensitive subject, money yeah. for somebody to admit that things are not going well. So the way to get them to open up to that is to talk to them first about why other investors reach out to you. Why other people that are just like them reach out to you and ask for help. So if I'm, you know, if my target audience is physicians, I would say, um, John, I, you know, I speak to a lot of physicians, you know, probably eight to nine a week. And what I'm typically hearing from them and why they reach out for help is they make really good money. Like they make solid money, but their biggest fear is not being able to sustain that in retirement because they have a nice lifestyle and their stock accounts are, you know, back up this year, but they're tired of riding the stock market roller coaster and want to get some more diverse, you know, diversification in their portfolio, but they have zero time to even begin to think about real estate investing. I don't suppose any of those have crossed your mind, or I can't imagine those have been challenges for you. That's how we get into the pain conversation is you make it a safe place for them to admit, yeah, you know, I do want to get into real estate. We lost some money last year in stocks because you already told them it's all these other people that you talk to that are just like them. Here's what they're tired of, frustrated with, nervous about, anxious about. That's how we get into the conversation about what's not working. So that's how we figure out, do you have the problems that we fix? And we, it's like scavenger hunt. Sales is a scavenger hunt. Do you have the problems that I fix? Does it hurt bad enough that you want to fix it? Are they financially qualified to be able to do something about it? What other decision makers need to be involved? Those, that's your qualification. That's everything that has to happen before we talk about how amazing razzle dazzle, right? Our investments are the, the part that we love. We got to do all that work up front. And when you qualify hard, the close is easy. I'm not, I'm not a fan of close. I don't teach closing tactics. You will never hear that from me because it doesn't work. I've been in sales for almost 18 years. There is no one liner that exists. I don't care if somebody's trying to sell it to you for $47 on the internet. There's not one closing line that exists that makes people throw money at you and say, that was it. That's all I needed to hear take my money, right? And they just throw six figures at you. It doesn't exist. The close happens organically because of the process that you went through and you really earned their trust because you asked so many great questions. Is this, are y'all with me? Are you getting oh, it? I'm seeing your yes. head. You know okay. what I do? I want to punch myself in the neck because I've been doing sales for you know, 30 some years and it is the questions, but it's no, no one's have really talked about the pain points. Because as salespeople, we just want to talk about how great our products are. And yeah. I'm there because you want to know about my product, but I'm never really in the past. Okay. Bicycles. Okay. If you talk about the joy of bicycles, great. You, maybe no one, maybe needs a, maybe they need a bike. So that's your joy. But, you know, never, uh, it, it's just amazing. Just that little turn uh, in the conversation can be so effective. Uh, it just... takes patience, right? Like, and I know you have incredible patience, Julie, of building really like building real relationships. It might take yeah. a couple phone calls to really get to know somebody. 
you know, I'm that person that wants everything done yesterday. And the older that I get and the more coaches I hire to beat that out of me, <laughs> I learned to have more patience in my business and letting relationships evolve and really spending time. And so it's going to take some time to, to, to build that relationship with somebody. It's not just how many investors can I slam through my Calendly every single week and just check the box, right? And you got this big funnel and you're like, I got to talk to 60 people a week, you know, to raise a million dollars a month on average. And you're just wearing yourself out because they're not quality conversations. They're not, we're just checking the box. And so if we focus more, if you remember this, I always love stuff that you can like put on a bumper sticker. Mm -hmm. The less you talk about what you do, the more you'll raise. And that sounds so counterintuitive, but the less you talk about what you do, the more you'll raise. And it's such a great, I wrote that down on a post-it note when I first started selling. The less you talk about what you do, the more you'll sell. Because it was my trigger, like Keely, close your mouth and start asking more questions. Because I was the product vomit girl when I first started. And I'm also a very uh, dominant personality type. And I was just basically verbally assaulting my prospects into buying. I was like, this is how you sell, right? And I lost a lot of deals and I'd hire sales coaches to help me get out of that frame of mind. But we got to have patience. We got to ask more questions, let the relationship evolve and really qualify somebody. You've got to look at your investments. Like what I do is um, it's like the ad in the luxury magazine that says call for pricing. Y'all know mm -hmm. what I'm talking about? The watch, you're like, man, that's pretty watch. You're like, how much is it? And you're like, oh man, it says call for pricing. You already know it's, <laughs> it's a lot of money. I want y'all to think about your business like that. We're not for everybody. That's why people join country clubs. That's why like, they like private clubs. People, you know, love to buy a Rolls Royce. You, you can't get a Rolls Royce sales rep. You could walk on that lot and you're going to be looking for a salesperson. Not even a lot. You could walk into a showroom and the doors are probably locked. You can't get a salesperson there or a Ferrari dealership. So you have to look at yourself like that. I'm not here to pounce on people. What I do is exclusive and people have to earn the right for me to invest the time to tell them about how this stuff works. So prove to me that you have the problems that I fix. So I save us both time if it's not the right fit. And that frame of mind really helps you get out of your way of thinking, I'm just bothering people with my investments. No, you're the call for pricing ad. You're like the thing that they want and they need, but they have to prove to you first and earn the right to hear about the investment. I just love that. Love you know, what I, what I, the way you, that you approach this is turns the idea of commoditizing this capital raising into something that's very special, very unique, very genuine. And I love that because I think for the last five, 10 years, there's a bunch of people running around, hey, at all the conferences, I don't know anybody, here's my card, I've got a deal. And you take that out, you don't even, you know, let's talk about this, let me get to know you. It's a solution, selling, it's truly amazing. And you've dropped so many tidbits here. Um, I, I do want to talk to you about action and behaviors. Now, on actions, we think about, okay, that's the newsletter, that's the uh, funnel, that's the leads, that's, you know, those can nurture, but they are like cookie cutter, right? This is how you do it. And so how many newsletters do you really need? So mm -hmm. what are the actions with this conversation? What do you put into play for actions that really resonate, that go along the same lines as the good conversation? Well, it's like I mentioned before, the whole, you know, I say check the box. We can't just check the box that we did the newsletter and we send it out, check the box, post it on social media, send it out, or hire a VA team, check the box, they're handling my social media. If it's not make, like really making an impact in your business, so how many of y'all have ever been completely overwhelmed by all the things that have to get done to raise capital, <laughs> the website, the funnels, the emails, the newsletter, <laughs> right? And we're like, oh my God, I'm going to pull my eyelashes out. That's always my, which I have actually y'all have like, as soon as I start doing this and pulling them out, it's, it's over because it's actually very satisfying. <laughs> Men are like, what are you talking about? And you get stressed, right? You start pulling your eyelashes out. Well, business should be fun and capital raising should be fun. And so we have to find a way to have joy in the process, to have fun in the process and not get so bogged down with the things that we're doing because we think we're supposed to be doing it, but it's not necessarily making an impact. 
So if you find yourself spending 15 to 20 hours a week behind your keyboard, behind your computer, in your house where you don't see anybody pushing out content and blogs and like taking chat GPT and making it your own and putting all this stuff out there, but you're not generating new conversations. You're not out there seeing people face to face or having, you know, I like to call it cappuccinos on zoom. You're not, or champagne, right? Whatever champagne, scotch on zoom, whatever you want to do, but we got to see people face to face. If we're not doing that stuff, you're going to be scrambling for capital when it's time to raise. It doesn't matter how big your list is. We've got to talk to people. And so I have, a, I have a client who's raised $17 million in like 18 months. He doesn't even have a website, y'all. And it's not that I recommend that. His life would be a lot easier if he'd have a website and, you know, some things that were automated. But his whole mindset has been like, I don't need that. Like, I got my phone. He's like, this is my capital raising machine. And he's not afraid to talk on the phone. We were at an event and um, <laughs> I love him. So he's Indian, right? And he he's talk, Indian doctors are like his thing. And his wife's a physician. And we were at an event and they're uh, like a real estate conference. And there was a huge Indian wedding. I used to be a wedding planner when I right out of college. And so loved the Indian weddings because they were like a three day party celebration. And they're huge. I mean, there were like 500 people in there. And so I was like, I saw them and I go, hey, like your people are upstairs, like all your investors. Cause I could tell this was a very expensive wedding. He was like, I've already been up there and talked to, you know, I already been up there and made the rounds. I'm like, of course you have. <laughs> Cause he's fearless and he's bold in meeting people, picking up the phone, having conversations. So if there was one activity that you look at every single week, are, do you have time allocated on your calendar to generate new conversations with people? Coffee's on Zoom, lunch is in person, getting out there and building your network. That is the single most important activity in your business. All the other stuff just makes your life easier. All the automations, funnels, build that over time. But don't let that stop you from getting out there and talking to people and building your investor community. Wow. That is so easy to some people, right? But it's saying it the right way, approaching the conversation, having some grace and listening right um so all right we've got the conversation we've got the action what about the behavior is what do we need to change because you know i can't dance i know i can dance i just can't wear a tutu okay i'm not wearing the tutu but i'll do the jazz and we'll wear regular clothes can you take somebody who really <laughs> is just a bull in the china shop has no tact. Can we make them change or create better behaviors to attract these conversations? Yes. It's funny you say that because there's one of my sales reps comes to mind. His name's Chris. This is like back in probably 2015. And he knew he was the bull in the China shop. We were working through it, but he lost a lot of deals because of that. But I, I would tell you that until he, you know, he learned. But the, the first key is do we have awareness of how we come across to people? Is there awareness of like how am I, you know, presenting myself? What is my my bot? What does my body language say about me? There's one of my sales reps in London was struggling with uh with, she had so many client potential clients that were saying, hey, I want to go work with this education counselor instead of her. And she was like, Why do why do these people keep leaving me? And what I tell y'all is when I went into the center and just was around her and saw that her energy things that are hard to pinpoint, but being around her, she, she sat like this. I know you can't really see me. Let me scoop back. She kind of sat like this, right? She did. She wasn't confident. She didn't put her shoulders back. She didn't sit with authority. She didn't walk through that office where her prospects would see her saying, I run this campus. Like people need to believe in your confidence and the conviction of your message. And how we present ourselves is so important. And that doesn't mean that you have to be loud and boisterous and change your personality. But there's a lot to be said if you're an introvert about a quiet, calm confidence. People feel that energy. So it's, it's awareness of how am I coming across to people and really being able to read your, pros, your potential, I say prospect, but your potential investors' body language as well. So I had a sales rep, his name's Evan, and he left our South Carolina office, y'all. And he moved to New York City. And our New York City campus was on Wall Street, like right above the bull on Wall Street in a high rise. 
And he really struggled. And I was worried about him when he made this movie. He's like, I want to move to New York, right? So I'm like, okay, I support it, right? And I'm helping my education director on how to coach them. And we had a sales manager on site. And he struggled. And the reason for that is because coming from South Carolina, he talked so flip and slow. I mm. love him, like the Southern gentleman. But he'd be like, you know, hey, Julie, like, I'm so great. It's so great to meet you. And I've been looking forward to talking. And these New Yorkers are like, pick up the pace, like <laughs> New York, right? And he was losing yeah. so many people because he could, he didn't have awareness. He didn't have awareness about how fast or how slow he was speaking. If I talked like this to start, I did a training earlier today about disc personality types and your personality profile, and there's four of them. And my personality type, if I were to talk this loud and this direct and this dominant in a conversation with a steady relator, who's much more introverted and pauses more in the conversation and talks a lot quieter when they ask questions, I have to adjust my own volume of speech and my pace and slowing down and asking them questions to really draw them in. And that takes awareness of how, how do people experience me in a conversation and how you sell, right? How you raise capital, because raising capital is selling, but how your investors experience you in a conversation is what will set you apart. It doesn't matter what other investments they're looking at. It's like, this feels right because I really connect to this person. That's real rapport is understanding how do I relate to them on a level that, of who they are, being the chameleon. I know people say match and mirror, that's important, but I'm trying to break it down to the, the minute, minute details of how important it is to notice those small things. Andy you said, know, especially in the third Keely, person. That is, uh, I know you, you have a whole personality thing and we could go on, we should have you come back because you just have so many wonderful pieces, how to talk to the different personalities, it's so valuable. Um, I've gotten chill after chill and you covering conversation, action, behavior, super helpful to so many people here. Um, I do have a list of questions that um, have come through. So I'm going to kind of run through those. But before we do that, I want to make sure that everybody knows about your event that's coming up on the 18th and 19th of, of this month. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's next week. Thank you for that, Julie. It's called Conversations Equal Capital. And it's a free masterclass that I do twice a year. I promise you, you'll have a good time. Like I pride myself on over delivering. I'm not the person that says you're going to teach you all these secrets and then I don't tell you a thing, right? Don't y'all hate those bait and switch, you know, yeah. webinars. We've all been to them before. That's not my style. I want you to walk away with stuff that you can actually implement and I try to incorporate fun in the process. If y'all are willing to deal with my crazy personality, if you might have seen a hint of it tonight, but I'm just a wild child, right? I am who I am, but I love to teach sales. And so if you wanna feel more confident in raising capital and kind of, especially some of you that are just getting started, like cut through all the crap, like what do I really need to focus on? Um, I think it'd be a great event for you to learn that. So it's on the 18th and 19th at 7 p.m. Central. And you can register if you just go to raisewithconfidence.com. You can register there and it'll have all the details there, uh, but we tackle a whole lot in a very small amount of time. So I would love to see you there if you've got time to attend. Now we do have, that is on a Tuesday night, my friends. It's a Tuesday night, You're right. right? You're right. Is that, that's the conflict of the Zoom at eight, but <laughs> I'm going to be there on Wednesday because okay. I want to hear, and we have a big speaker next week. So I don't want to take away from Keely. Um, but it, you know, maybe there's a way to get a, uh, recording. I don't know, but um, yeah, there is a recording. Okay. And full disclosure, Julie, I would never want to compete with the queen of Tuesday nights. <laughs> the only reason I did it on Tuesday is I'm actually taking a vacation because my coach is like, y'all hire coaches for everything. Cause I need a lot of help over here, but she's actually making me take a vacation because I am a, you know, recovering workaholic and I leave on Thursday morning. So that's why I did there it Tuesday, go. Wednesday, instead of Wednesday, wow. Thursday. I know you, you took me into consideration. I appreciate that. Um, all right. Angel wants to know, do you feel it's more important to get, get the no up front or get the yes first? Um, meaning angel, can you give me some more when detail? You, when you, you said, can I ask you some questions? And I want oh, yes, you to be order. really 
Yeah. So yes. do you want them to say no? Because a lot of training says, yes, 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 yes. Good. Now we're going. So yes. yours is a little different. That's so insightful, Angel. That's like one of those nuances that very few people catch on to. So I'm very impressed. Um, always start with a no. Always, always, always start with a no. Simply because every salesperson they've ever experienced is trying to corner them into saying yes and set up questions, ask them set up questions. And they're like nodding their head and like, do you agree that, you know, investing in commercial real estate could help you and your family provide, you know, provide more passive income and build your wealth over time. Th those are set up questions that people expect it. And so they're triggered and then their walls go up. So I always start with a no. And when I first started teaching this, so I did this in the trenches, right? For myself and our family's business. And then corporate said, can you come teach this to the whole network? all the franchise organizations. And when I first started teaching this, some of my, some of the guys that I, I didn't, I hadn't hired these people, right. They were already on the teams and some of them were a little bit resistant because they were, they were more of the used car sales kind of wheeling and dealing types that just weren't going to be a good fit long-term, but they'd say like, well, why would you give people permission to say no, then you're going to lose the deal. And so my question is, is it really that simple? If we give people permission to say no, then that means they're going to say no. Because if sales were that easy, then we would just tell them like, you have permission to say yes, and then they would invest with us. But that's not how it works, right? So the, the goal is start with the no so their walls are down. And I get them to say no twice. I check it, right? Are you sure you seem, you seem like a nice woman? Yeah, I'll tell you no. Okay, great. The other side of that is, and then we just finish it off. And all that happens is, you know, all that tension, it's like a tea kettle. It's about to, you know, boil. All that tension's gone. And now they're willing to really talk to you and tell you what's not working because they're not waiting for the shoe to drop. They're not waiting for the pitch to start because you got them to say no up front. So I love that question, Angel. It was brilliant. Yeah, no, I, and I think it's, you'll hear a lot of sales coaches say, yes, 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 yes. So yeah, um, I don't see any more questions here. If anybody has a question before we get on with the show, um, please uh, raise your hand. We'd love to hear and address your question. Keely's got so much information. You got to get on her list, connect with her on LinkedIn, on Facebook, I think too, right, Keely? I'm, on both? I'm probably more on, I'm on LinkedIn more often, but I'm, I check all my yeah. messages. So if y'all want to yeah. chat hey, with me hey, anywhere. Can I ask one quick one? Sure. Zandy, yeah. So Keely, you know, I, I we've talked before and you kind of have, you have a process, but I wouldn't say it's as kind of organized in the sense that you'd have you know one task to the next so if you were to try to kind of mark out your day would you spend most of your time on the phones is there kind of like a certain kpis that you like to hit as you're trying to hit those numbers of investors that you're reaching i love that question andy you're, you're i need an andy in my life to organize <laughs> me <laughs> sonia knows me well enough y'all that like my life is covered like sticky notes everywhere, right? Like, oh, gotta do this sticky note. So um, yes, I'm kind of a mad woman. I'm not as organized as I would like to be, but I focus on the needle movers in the business. So when I look at, y'all are going to laugh at this, maybe this will help, but I separate my categories into my checklist and I'm a paper person. And I also use some stuff electronic, but when I'm feeling completely overwhelmed, it goes on different lists. And I highlight the IPAs, the income producing activities. So, cause you have a lot of to-dos on your list and it's the, here's the key. What takes up all your time every single day is the stuff that is urgent. It's triage, right? And it's because you have your email open and you see an email from an investor. Now you're dealing with that. And all of a sudden somebody messaged you on LinkedIn and you're over here and we're losing focus on what actually moves the needle in the business and builds the investor list. And so for me, it's highlighting what are those income producing activities? And I know it is get, it's getting my message out there. It's getting on podcasts. It's getting speaking engagements. It is generating new conversations. It's connecting with investors, just calling them to see how they're doing, calling my investors now to tell them we converted to a 506 C and now we have a public offering. And I'm curious, you know, I know you've, we've had a ton of fun having you in the vineyards. Who do you know that you think I should send this to? Like asking for referrals, right? Like doing those types of activities that really move the needle. And the challenge is those are the important tasks, but they're not urgent. And so they always get shoved to the side because we're in triage all day, every day, if we don't take hold of our calendar. So I usually, I try to take a look at the important list that's not urgent because those are the income producing activities. 
the capital you need, right? The, the conversations you have today will raise the capital four to five months from now. So Andy, I'd probably say you, your brain is like brilliant algorithm. You could probably create some sort of a, you know, like a robot, like beep, beep, no, beep, no, beep. No, no, I, 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 no, I have the brain of you, just not the personality. So like, I, that's why I'm asking you the question, like, how do I fix this, this, this foible? So this is great. Yeah. Thank you. Carve it out on your calendar, carve time out on your calendar two to three times a week, you know, an hour and a half two to three times a week. And that is the time that you dedicate to new conversations, generating new conversations with people. Maybe it's researching and filling up your August account, August calendar with networking events. Yeah. But those are the behaviors that move, move the needle in the business and everything else is absolute chaos. And what you'll find is you'll lose your to-do list and life still goes on and the business doesn't crumble. So you have to ask yourself, are these even really important in the first place? I don't know <laughs> what moves the needle. So focus on the IPAs. Love so, it, girl. Kate, Thank you. Thank you. you. All right, Keely, um, if somebody wants to work with you in your sale as a sales coach, what is the process? A conversation. (laughs) Surprise. (laughs) It's a conversation. But for me to make sure that I really understand your business, because I am, you can ask any of my clients that I've worked with. I don't, I only want to work with people that I can help. And from a values perspective, we've got to be aligned and from like a timeline and expectations and what you really want out of your business. So I just really want to get to know my people first. So I have an application. It's on my website. If it's in the capital raising um, space, which I know all of you are, many of you are, I do group coaching. So I have a group coaching program that's called Capital Raising Made Simple. It's a ton of fun. It's an annual thing, but we meet several times a week, um, small, it's intimate. I I keep it like that on purpose. And then I do one-on-one coaching, That's minimal. It's one-on-one coaching is hard to fit into the calendar, but I take on about six one-on-one clients at a time. So I think it depends on your business goals, but just reach out to me and we can have a conversation and it may or may not be the right fit. And worst case scenario is we enjoy cappuccino on zoom and we get to meet each other and hopefully uh, help each other build our businesses and refer, send you some referrals. There's always something good that'll come out of it. Well, it has been such a treat to have you here, Keely. Uh, I just, love you. You're just so energetic and positive and helpful. I just really appreciate you being here tonight to share so such valuable information with everybody so generously. So I, I again, I, I thank you so much. Of course. Thank you for listening y'all for every, I know y'all's time. This is y'all's time is worth a thousand an hour. At least I'm telling you, go calculate it. So thank you for investing it here. And Julie, thank you for this incredible platform you've built. I appreciate oh. it.